Hi, this is Father Joe Giussetti. Thank you for joining me once again. In our last installment of this series, we talked about vocal prayer. Now there's vocal prayer that we do spontaneously, just speaking uh, from our heart. And then there are more fixed prayers. And we have a rich tradition of many, many beautiful prayers that can speak to our heart, that can lift our minds and hearts to God. And there was some resources with them last time. Something in addition to that is sometimes we write our own prayers. Simply write down what's in your heart, but write it down. And there's some beautiful prayers. And that's probably how a lot of those other prayers came to be anyway. So that's something else to do. That our vocal prayer can be both that free form, that spontaneous prayer, and those set prayers that we learn. And we write those spontaneous prayers down. They also become set prayers. So there's a bit of overlap there. I'd like to talk today about devotional prayer. So remember, we talked about liturgical prayer, devotional prayer, and personal prayer. Liturgical prayer is that which, which pertains to the entire church. It's that public prayer of the church. Uh, personal prayer is that which we do by ourselves. In between, there is devotional prayer. Sometimes this is known as popular religiosity. And this is something that flows from the liturgy and leads toward them, at least it should. It's something very valuable. It's something very rich. It's something that can take on form in so many different ways. Often there is a level of emotion that isn't necessarily suited to the liturgy. Lots of times these embody local expressions of faith or even expressions of ethnic identity. They may be personal that someone will pray by him or herself for. It may be communal. It may be a group of people. Very often it is lay led. And so I'd like to go through some of these uh, today. One of these, one of the most popular ones, would be the rosary. Now we're going to have a separate uh, video on the rosary. So after that, another one is the Stations of the Cross. A very, very rich and varied devotion. Just a quick background on that. So during medieval times, people would journey to Jerusalem. They would go on pilgrimage. And there's a street in Jerusalem called Via Dolorosa, the Sorrowful Way. And people would go along this way that they thought that Jesus had carried the cross. Along the way, there are these different chapels, these different stations. And people would stop and pray as they were literally walking in the footsteps of Jesus. Now, the political situation changed, so it got even more difficult for people to go there. But Franciscan missionaries returning from the Holy Land started to set up these stations of the cross in churches so people could spiritually walk in the footsteps of Jesus, uh, even if they could not walk in his footsteps literally. So that's the idea behind the way of the cross or the stations of the cross, that we are walking in the footsteps of Jesus spiritually. One of the nice things about the stations of the cross in our church is that they are along the arcade there, and you can actually walk the way of the cross. Now, there are many different versions of the Stations of the Cross. Every year on Good Friday, the Stations of the Cross are prayed uh, at the Colosseum. This has been going on for many years. And every year, the Pope invites uh, someone else to write meditations on the Stations of the Cross. This year, he invited a group of prisoners to write meditations on the Stations of the Cross. So just to go through a few of these real quickly, uh, one of the most popular ones is by St. Alphonsus Liguori. We use this sometimes here at St. Therese. It's a very moving, very devout uh, version of the Stations of the Cross. And for example, the 11th Station, Jesus is nailed to the cross. The prayer is, in part, my despised Jesus, nail my heart to your cross and let it remain there always never to leave you again. Okay. Bind my heart, nail my heart to your cross, and let it remain there, never to forsake you again. There's another version that we use quite often. It's 
called Everyone's Way of the Cross. I remember attending the Stations of the Cross at St. Thomas More, where I grew up, uh, in 1978. First time I heard this, I was so moved by this version of the Stations of the Cross. It's written by a Catholic deacon. Uh, and the way it just connects the stations with daily life. And so the fifth station, Simon helps Jesus. The response is, Lord, make me realize that every time I wipe a dish, pick an object up off the floor, assist a child in some small task, give another in preference in traffic or the store. Each time I feed the hungry, clothe the naked, teach the ignorant, or lend my hand in any way, it matters not to whom. My name is Simon, and the kindness I extend to them, I really extend to you. So that beautiful notion of doing little things with great love, St. Therese would certainly appreciate that, and remembering that we are serving Christ in those moments. As I said, there are many other versions that go on and on. There's, there's children's versions, there are ones that are based on scriptures. There's ones that look at it through the eyes of Mary. Uh, this is a special one. It's called A Journey to Calvary, The Way of the Cross for the Terminally Ill. This was written by a parishioner of ours. Uh, uh, Carla Riga was writing this about her mom, Pauline Riga. Uh, Pauline has her picture outside the kitchen downstairs in the Woolridge Center in the parish hall. And she was involved with the bread bakes for many years. And her daughter, her daughter Carla, wrote this way of the cross, uh, really in connecting it with her mom's uh, final illness and death. So, for example, first station, Jesus is condemned to death. Okay, this is the meditation for it. The exploratory surgery did not go well. When I awoke, the look in my family's eyes told me that it was much worse, cancer. There was nothing they could do. That day I felt like I'd been given a death sentence. Jesus, what did you do as you stood before Pontius Pilate and received a sentence to die? So connecting our sufferings and uniting them with the sufferings of Jesus. There is a recent version that came out. We've done this once here written by Father Paul Turner of our diocese. It is a um, Stations of the Cross in atonement for uh, victims of abuse. So, as I said, there's this tremendously rich devotion there with the Stations of the Cross. Uh, another tradition, okay, there's Novenas. Now, after the Ascension, the disciples went back to uh, Jerusalem. They were there with Mary, and they were waiting, and they were praying. And nine days after that was Pentecost. And so that's really the origin of Novena, Novena coming from the word nine. So the whole idea, it reminds us that we are to be constant in our prayer, that we are to continually pray. And so praying a Novena is really a way of calling us to constancy in prayer, okay? It's not because there's something magical about the number nine. It's recalling that original novena, waiting for the Holy Spirit to come. I talked about Dorothy Day and her spirituality when I did the video on autobiographies. And in her autobiography, she writes one time, well, what did I do at a time like that? She said, I did what any Catholic would do. I started to pray a novena. Okay? Another uh, devotional prayer. The Angelus prayed three times a day, reminding us of the Annunciation, reminding us of the Incarnation. Another one we have is uh, litanies. If you've ever been to an ordination or even at the Easter Vigil at baptisms, when they chant the litany of the saints, and so there are all these, there's these verses and response, and then we start invoking the saints. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us. St. Joseph, pray for us. St. John the Baptist, pray for us. And it goes on and on and on. And you really start to realize how big the church is and that we're part of something 
bigger than ourselves. So in the liturgy, sometimes there are these litanies, the litany of the saints. There are many other litanies, and these go on and on to uh, the litany of the holy name of Jesus. The litany of the sacred heart has some beautiful imagery. It talks about the sacred heart of Jesus, glowing furnace of charity, have mercy on us. Gay, uh, sacred heart of, heart of Jesus, house of God and gate of heaven, have mercy on us. The litany of the Loretto is a very popular one in honor of the Blessed Mother. There is litany to St. Joseph, litanies to other saints. So that's another rich part of our tradition. And sometimes these start to overlap with activities as well. You know, a May crowning uh, is something like that going to the cemetery in November and praying for the dead or on Memorial Day. Uh, there's a beautiful Mexican tradition called the Posadas, which is for nine nights in honor of the nine months of Mary's pregnancy. Uh, people will go from door to door and there'll be two statues of Mary and Joseph or a couple dressed up at Mary, as Mary and Joseph. And they go and they knock on a door and they sing asking, to be taken in, asking for posada. And from outside, they, from inside, they sing, go away, we don't want you here. And they do that three times. The fourth time, someone lets them in. Traditionally, they would pray the rosary. And then traditionally, on the very last night, they would have a party as well with a piñata and so forth. But there's something experiential about that, that you're uh, uh, outside in the cold, knocking on the door. So you're not just reading about it, it's something that you're experiencing. Uh, the St. Joseph table would be another tradition as well. And so there is this great wealth of devotional prayer. Now there's the strength to devotional prayer. Now sometimes we also have to remember they don't take the place of liturgical prayer. Uh, as I said, ideally they should flow from the liturgy and lead towards the liturgy. Sometimes they become expressions of ethnic identity, and there's nothing wrong with that. But the primary expression, of course, is to be an expression of our faith, of our faith in Jesus Christ, of our faith in God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and with all its, in all its richness. So uh, devotional prayer is a very important part of our life. Different popes have talked about this. Pope Francis particularly talks about it. And so there's a great richness there uh, that we encourage you to take part of. Now, you can't take part in all of it. That's not the point. But to find, to explore some of that and find some of the, that richness and let some of that richness of the prayer become part of your own prayer. And in the meantime, we continue to pray. We continue to pray for each other and for our suffering work.